How's everyone doing today? Great. A bit sore? Who's a bit sore from the outside? Yeah. My calves are a bit sore. It must have been because of the, you know, the... <laughs> yeah, yeah, just... <laughs> it was fun, though, being able to have a time together when there was no judgment of you dancing, hey? <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> we didn't judge you, Bob. We didn't judge you. So, so all of you got pictures of us be doing stupid things. You got to hand them in after the group today. <laughs> uh, no, we'd just like to thank those of you who stayed behind last night too, just to help us tidy up and things like that, um, because we finished up leaving quite late. and. Um, we wanted to also thank uh, those of you who come and help set up and tidy up for these sessions, um, as well as also thank you all for your donations as well. And one thing we had donated to us is this lovely painting behind. It's quite nice, isn't it? Um, if you, yes. I think it's Emotions Rising, I think is what it's called. Yeah. And it's by an artist, Sarah Larson, her name is, and Sarah's on the Divine Love Path, and, and uh, we'd been eyeing off this painting for some time, myself and Mary. <laughs> and, uh, and without her knowing. Without actually. her knowing, <laughs> ironically. And, uh, and, um, and she finished up uh, giving it to us this morning. So, yeah, so that was lovely. Yeah. So just thought I'd show you that. If you want to see some of her stuff, We've got some cards of her, I think, up, up the back there. There was also, I think, somebody, was it more than who? Yeah, who, who you have some gratitude diaries, basically. It's, it started off as a, as, a, as a diary journal to journal your thoughts um, and feelings of gratitude when I was on the um, natural love path. Yeah, yeah. But what's actually happening is I'm... I'm it's integrating and it's now becoming, it's not totally a, you know, a divine love path book, but yeah. it, it has got some spiritual quotes in it. But there's a quote by you, AJ, and there's a few quotes by um, James Padgett. And yeah. over time, it's, it's evolving and it's dedicated to the inner child. So yeah. it's, it's a process book but, and yeah. also a, a, a diary. And you're offering it up the back there for, by donation? It's by donation, yeah. Oh, right. yeah. So, so just see me nice. if you'd like one. Yeah, so that's back there available to you if you want a diary for the New Year, is it? New Year diary? Okay. Um, today, we, uh, myself and Mary, haven't uh, fully decided what we're going to talk about today. So, <laughs> um, we've had some good ideas. We had some good ideas, yeah. <laughs> some of which uh, we will probably discard <laughs> during the session. Um, but what Mary wants to do firstly is have a chat with everyone. So, what I'm going to do is sit down for a while while Mary has a chat, and then. Uh, and then I'll come up and have a chat to you about a subject that I think the majority of you are going to find quite confronting. So we'll see how we go with that. <laughs> uh, I wanted to uh, spend some time up the front today. Uh, I'm quite nervous, so uh, bear with me. But um, I wanted to... I wanted well, I wanted to trigger some emotions that I have around um, talking about this experience for me on the Divine Love Path and my journey with my identity, which is a um, lot is coming up for me at the moment around that. Um, so I just wanted to... Uh, but I have a big emotion that um, people are not really that interested in that, um, which I understand because you're all on your own journeys with your own identities. Um, so I wanted to open the space to see if anyone wanted me to talk about that. Um, yeah. There's a few nods. Uh, and I haven't planned anything. Um, so I'll, I'll encourage you guys to ask questions if you'd like to. There's a taker at the back already. <laughs> Mary, I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the first time you started to become aware of your identity and how that made you feel and, and what kind of processes you went through in becoming aware of it? Um, 
uh, it took me very largely by surprise. I, th I think I've spoken about it before, um, but uh, I'll just give you a brief summary. Uh, I met AJ at my parents' home and um, uh, through a series of events, um, I ended up going to spend some time with him overseas. And on about the fourth day that I was there, uh, a huge emotion came up for me. And I was actually very angry and I felt very abandoned by this man. Uh, my background has got nothing to do with the Bible or Mary Magdalene. And uh, really, I was never fascinated in any of that stuff, um, ironically. Uh, and so I had this huge emotional experience, which was very scary for me. I, I just felt like I'm, I do not understand what's happening uh, it doesn't make any sense, even in the logical sense that um, I didn't think the first emotion I would have would be anger towards my soulmate. Um, uh, and it was quite specific. It was about death and being abandoned. And I hadn't even considered that that would be an emotion. Um, and I really didn't believe AJ, you know. I didn't, I didn't, I was open and I couldn't leave it alone, but I didn't have any conviction that he, he was Jesus. Um, yeah, so that was the first experience for me. But um, beyond that, I, I then thought, I can't deal with this emotionally and I really shut down quite a lot. And what's happening for me at the moment is that um, I'm, I'm trying to open myself to that experience because whenever I go into a process, it comes up. Um, and into the experience of the larger ramifications of what that means. For about a year, I have been um, going, okay, I've had another life <laughs> and I'll just experience that, but I haven't considered what it means to uh, be one of a few people who's reincarnated, uh, someone who's got divine truth inside of them and someone who has... Jesus as a soulmate. That's, I have a lot of unworthiness about that. Yeah. yeah. And if it's not too personal, what was your first memory? Um, I, I was listening to a, a song by Lamb. Do you know Lamb? Um, and it's um, Gorecki. And it's about um, finding the one that you've always waited for. It's been a favourite song of mine forever, even though I had no feeling of there being a one person on the planet for you, or a soulmate concept. I never had that. Um, I was listening to it because I just liked the song. And um, AJ was somewhere else in the house and he came down and the minute I saw him, I just felt massive grief uh, that I couldn't understand. And it quickly turned into anger. I was really angry at him that, you know, I loved you so much and you left me and I had a child and you left me. And, like, the, the experience of feeling like you've had a child when you have not had a child is very scary. Um, yeah, so that was the memory. And I actually distanced myself from AJ for the entirety of the day and... Uh, I think I was showing Josh my journal the other day uh, where I was writing. I don't understand what is happening to me. This is incredibly bizarre. Um, uh, why am I so angry? What does all this mean? Uh, it really, um, psychologically, it was very strange. But it was like the emotion comes up and it's undeniable like that it's an experience for you. It's... Um, when I met AJ, I said, I don't want you to talk about anything that might be suggestive to me. I don't want to know what happened in the first century. I don't want to know um, anything. And, and he respected that, um, although he did point out I was being quite controlling. <laughs> 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 Which, of course, I was. Um, and so... To have these emotions come up, which is starting to happen more and more for me now, they're not, um, they're not even what the history books say or the so-called history books say and um, they're so overwhelming um, that I can't deny them anymore. I've tried very hard to for a long time. <laughs> Nina. 
Mary, I, I would like to know anything about your first life that you can remember that you would like to share. I think like um, where I'm particularly interested is I think it's important that the truth of the crucifixion actually be told and that that somehow gets... I don't know what else to say about it. And, yeah, so around that time and what happened to your life after that until you passed? Okay. That's pretty... Um, that's really emotional for me. Um, and... Um, I've started writing things down, so hopefully I can share things in a written way as well um, because at the moment, um, verbally, it's pretty powerful for me. But um, when I have these experiences, I, it's not like I have pictures. It's not like a movie or a photo that you've seen. Uh, it's, like, it's like if you've seen something tragic occur... I think I was saying to Anna yesterday, if you watch your dog be run over by a car, every time you remember that, you remember the visual and you remember the emotion that you had at that time. Well, for me, it's, it's just like that. There's a deep knowing of what happened and the emotions involved, but I don't have the picture. Um, you don't have the detail. You have, you have detail, but it's not like a visual, if that makes sense. Yeah. There's plenty of nuances, but um, th it's not a visual experience. Um, so I guess around the crucifixion, I remember being pregnant and um, just a lot of feelings of deep loss and grief. And beyond that, um, a lot of fear about what my life was, a lot of fear for my safety and the safety of my child. And a sense of leaving all of my friends and um, my country of origin. Uh, there's a bit more to it, but that's essentially what I remember. And as I go on, more stuff gets added, if that makes sense, as I open more to this. And that's why I've found it so difficult to open to my emotions, because when I do, it's incredibly overwhelming. Um, it feels like I might die from grief and um, yeah and as I open more to different things like uh, different parts of myself essentially at the moment, my sexuality, my being vulnerable to a partner, family issues, all of, I have strong law attraction with all of those things. As I, as I open more to them emotionally in my life now, more comes in from that past experience, if that makes sense. Um, and, and of course that's how I'm accessing a lot of the causal emotion. Um, yeah. I also had a really powerful experience last week of connecting to... Um, and I just find it so incredibly bizarre, Nina, because um, it's so real and it's so intricate, but it's so unlike my life now and it's unlike anything I ever thought that I would ever experience. But I connected to a huge emotion around the events of the crucifixion actually being a huge law of attraction to events that happened when I was a young woman, a, a teenager in the first century in that I was... I, I fell pregnant through a sort of an abusive situation and I was made to leave my family home and... So I was alone and abandoned, reject feelings of rejection. All of the stuff that I projected at AJ when I first connected to the memory, you rejected me, you didn't love me, all of these things actually had their origin with my father in the first century and being asked to leave, well, kicked out of home and even being pregnant at the time and being completely alone in the world and having to leave. And 
it's, this is so hard for me to talk about publicly. I feel, um, I have a huge emotion about it. That I will be rejected, which is part of what I'm processing. Um, because no one can ever believe us. I, I can hardly believe what's happening in my own life. I, I don't know how any of you might. So thanks for the opportunity to challenge me. I nearly didn't ask the question. Thanks, Nina. It's good. Hi, Mary. Um, I'm not sure if it's a question, but it's something that came up while you were talking, and it was like, because um, a lot of questions about your past life and that, but what interested me was you being a celestial being at one time and um, coming down to... <laughs> Um, coming down to earth and um, how you're experiencing that and how you're recognising that about yourself? I find it really hard to um, feel that I'm a celestial being. <laughs> um, I do have a really big sense that... Um, Somewhere inside of me, I'm actually a really loving person. <laughs> but I figure, I reckon you all have that feeling, don't you? <laughs> that underneath all our stuff, we're just amazing. <laughs> I think AJ's probably had more experience of those memories. I think um, I, haven't, I have no memories, really, of the spirit world. Uh, uh, just some dark ones about after I passed. And I think the way it happens is that... Um, the more painful stuff gets triggered first, obviously. So, yeah, sorry, Dan, not really knowing. But when you do, will you tell us? Yeah. Sorry to take you back there again, but when when you were pregnant in the first century, um, not from Jesus, is that why the the whole prostitute issue? Where did that come in? I'm still on a big journey with this one, because. Um, uh, I have a lot of shame, a lot of sexual shame, and um, what my memory is thus far, what I've allowed myself to connect to, is about, um, like I certainly wasn't a high priestess, <laughs> um, more about being a young woman uh, in a very vulnerable situation who uh, AJ tells me was quite attractive <laughs> and um, you, using sex as a, wa as a way to survive mm -hmm. with men, yeah. So um, I think that's where that comes from, mm -hmm. yeah. I certainly have the feeling that I was viewed, I have connected with a lot of memories around when I met Yeshua feeling... Um, very much judged and rejected by the people, the, the disciples, you know, because of my past, which was quite... I was viewed as um, a fallen woman or something, you know. I wasn't mixing in mainstream society. That's my feeling so far, yeah. Barbara has a question. Okay. Uh, sorry. John, I, th 
Oh, yeah, okay. Hi, Perry. Um, I just would like to know about, after Jesus passed away, your teachings um, and what we've been told about you going on and teaching and spreading his word and and can you elaborate a bit on that? I think that's very interesting. <laughs> uh, I haven't connected to any certain memories about that, but I do have the strong feeling that that's what happened. Definitely, yeah. Um, and, I, and I think that did happen in France. Yeah, that's, th I have very, um, it seems like when there's a painful memory, then that becomes very real to me uh, because it gets triggered and then the emotions come up surrounding that. Um, so I have connected to, um, I was starting to connect to quite a bit of emotion around my death. which was quite punishing because I feel that I was teaching and of who, who I was and those kinds of things, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's as much as I remember at the moment. Mary, um, I was just wondering about your connection with God in this life, like from childhood. Can you tell us a little bit about that, if, if there was? Yeah. Um, My, uh, in my family this time, um, my parents have been on a natural love path for a long time and, I w and uh, my dad has uh, some, a lot of wounds from Catholic past so he has a lot of stuff around. Um, it's really triggering for me to talk about my family as well because they're really <laughs> angry at me. Um, I feel like I put my parents in the place of God for a lot of this life because I felt the feelings that I've connected to as feeling really abandoned by God as well and I think that happens through the process of reincarnation and so um, yeah I've always had a really strong sense of spiritual you know of always uh, from when I was really little been reading my parents books and all of these things and and I, I remember now being a child and writing and uh, feeling that that's a very mediumistic connection that I had but I had no um, framework for that um, and I think a lot of because I put my parents in that position it really blocked the God connection for me yeah it's really a beautiful thing to connect with God and I'm just feeling so much gratitude to establish that connection, faint as it seems, most of the time. Yeah. Um, I would actually like to know a bit more about your death in the first century. I've I don't really know the events so, or much about history in that aspect of it and I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit more about that. How spe specific do you want me to be? <laughs> do you mean... Um, I feel that I was tortured to death. Um, was your child young? No. Uh, she was in her early 20s and she wasn't with me. She was married and had her own family and she had left because people were coming for us. Yeah, and I was tortured. Okay. And on a more positive note, what's your favourite memory so far from the first century? The really th hard thing about these memories is that you don't get the good ones till you go through the bad ones. So that's another reason why I have been so resistive to this process because every time I go there, there's just a lot of pain. I remember loving someone really a lot. I have connected to that and that's beautiful. Yeah.
25 questions, but just one. Um, I'd like to know about your guide or your guides for this life. You know, who guides the Magdalene? I mean, and I'd also like to say before you answer, I'm really grateful you're up there talking. I feel like I want to rescue you, but the beautiful feminine energy coming from you yes it's just like music thanks so thank you um you i think you picked up on my guides once didn't you and shannon has as well they don't want to overwhelm me is what they told me <laughs> i don't um yeah i don't know who, who they are they're, they're celestial and so far, that only the women get to talk because I'm still dealing with the men. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they tell me they're my sisters and that we've been through a lot together. So, yeah. Hey Mary, <laughs> um, do you remember your parents from the first sanctuary? Do you Not specifically. Uh, okay, no. so you don't really, like, I just wanted to ask if there's much of a um, difference between your parents now in this life as opposed to the parents in the first sanctuary again? Yeah, I, I think there is a difference, a big difference. What I um, what stresses me out sometimes is that um, you have this this life, and then you reincarnate, and all of the memories that you, all the things you dealt with before, then it go through your parents' injuries now. So you have this set of injuries that relate to your parents' emotions about what happened then, if that makes sense. But I do think that part of that means that there's a similarity between... The t I, I, AJ might have to answer this question because he's been doing it a lot longer than me. Um, I feel there are similarities and differences, but that's just an intuition. Yeah. yeah. What did you ask? <laughs> <laughs> there a specific reason? I just wanted to... Um no, well, you get to choose your parents in this mm. life, and I just wanted to know if they were completely different to the ones to the, in the first sanctuary, and if you yeah. wanted to go down a completely different alley in this life, and with your spirituality. And yeah, I think the purpose of this life was to was to go. I I get so triggered about this because I have to acknowledge that I chose to go through this and sometimes th that really bugs me. <laughs> <laughs> I want to blame someone. Uh, <laughs> I think we chose our parents I in order to access the memories. That's why I feel like there's some similarities, you know, because we, we had to remember some way. Yeah. Um, do you agree with that, AJ? No, not really, do you? Sorry. <laughs> Is my mic on? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I agree with that, but I, there's more to it than that too. It's a lot to do with the feelings we chose to feel so that we could show others how to feel and work their way through those same feelings. <laughs> Sometimes I connect with this feeling of how much I want, how much I love all of you and I just really want to be able to do this so that I can share how we can get through our stuff. Thank you, everyone.
everyone. Mary, what things have you um, have you discovered that um, you could share with us about your emotional processing journey from not knowing anything about processing emotions to where you are now? What things have you discovered that have worked for you that maybe you could share with us that might work for us also? Sure. I think you'll find it's a fairly similar answer than what AJ would give you. Um, prayer. But also the biggest thing for me, uh, the biggest turning point for me was probably, I think you all remember when I got so enthusiastic about emotions of self-deception. <laughs> um, and in essence for me that is about... I need to have the desire to be completely honest with myself and what my emotions are about. And that encompasses um, being willing to feel the harm I have done to others. Um, I see that a lot of people get stuck around that area and I have. Um, my unloving expectations of others. Uh, when I felt into that and really looked at that quite honestly, that um, seemed to open up a whole new space for me of humility. And um, understanding emotions of self-deception in, in the ways that I'd prefer to punish myself rather than feel the harm that has come to me from others. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the, r instead of feeling unloved by someone, by my parents, I'll question myself, doubt myself or punish myself for the way they're treating me. So that's what I mean about having the desire to be really honest with myself. It's not enough, is it, Pete? <laughs> <laughs> I think you've got to really want it. Desire is huge. And um, one of the reasons that I'm up here is because uh, very recently I decided that I really wanted it. I really want to shift the damage that's in my soul and I can't do that half-heartedly and it's really scary. Um, so I've got to be willing to feel like I'm going to lose my mind. I've got to be willing to feel like um, everyone will reject me. I've got to be willing to feel um, that people are going to get angry at me when I don't uh, play to their addictions anymore, that kind of thing. Yeah. don't know what else to tell you, Pete. Hi, Mary. Um, I have a question. It's just a curiosity um, regarding the memories that AJ t took upon himself. Um, I, 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 I'm just um, curious as to does he share those memories like as you're um, coming into your memories, does he share some of those memories or do you just gradually get those memories back also or does he sort of fill in the pieces of the puzzle as you're you know getting your memories back um, what I think will happen is when we're at one with God we'll remember everything so at the moment we're both in a process of releasing the injuries uh, like like everyone we're releasing all the injuries that impair our connection with God and once that's done we'll be at one with God so at the moment, the memories that I'm having are um, 
helping me to do that remove the injuries that are there um, and so it's not as you've seen it's not a complete record of my life when we're at one with God I guess I'll remember everything including what AJ took at the moment AJ doesn't really talk to me about the stuff I know um, I know some of what he's been through um, but it it doesn't feel like it's in me and um, it doesn't really relate to what I'm connecting to either. It's more in my early childhood uh, in the first century. And so far I haven't had much of that at all, really nothing of that at all. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Josh. Hey, Mary. Um, I was just wondering, um, you know, when you, I was just wondering, like, throughout the last year when you connect to your inner child, are, is, is your inner child emotions predominantly suddenly you feel in the first century as that child or do you have memories of this life? And when you go into, like, Little Mary or... Little Mary is usually this life. Um because I feel like that's where I shut down a lot of my emotions. Uh, when I met AJ, I was pretty emotionally shut down. I thought I wasn't, but I was. And um, so when I go into my child, it's usually feeling around how I shut myself down or how I was shut down, let's say, how I was shut down in my environment as I was growing up this life. Um, yeah, so that's, and when I have the first century experiences, it's not, um, I feel the age that I was when it happened. And it's the same as having the sensation of, or the knowledge or the emotional knowledge of having had children or having a child with me. And so it, I feel the age of what I, what I was then. Does that answer your so question? So a lot of those ones that you're, you felt there are an adult feelings from another life. You don't connect with... Yeah, but I, I think that's what is like your causal emotion. So your causal emotion is when you're a kid. And my causal emotion, it, it seems like even my causal emotion from this life usually has a link that's much... This is why I kept getting stuck with my emotional processing because I'd go to here and then it wouldn't be clear. And then... It, and I didn't even... Um, I wasn't trying to remind myself to go to the first century, far from it. Um, but it's only in the last l really little while that I've gone, I want to do this, if I'm just going to experience whatever's there, that I suddenly get taken right back there. Does that answer your question? Not really. Yeah, oh, I just was trying to get an idea of how, how it happens. Like, yeah, because I... I, I... I think... Like, you know how I was saying about um, you come in, in this lifetime, through the filters of your parents. So, bam, you're there. And those filters and are representing... A, well, that's like my dad's got an injury around God. My mum's got an injury around men. So, when I arrive and I have the memory of being raped into my mum and she's got all this stuff about men, I'm going to... That's going to... That is going to, yeah, that's what gives it the emotional resonance. Because when I come in, there's nothing there. It's like, yeah, I was raped. But when I come into a woman who's got all this stuff about men, suddenly that's a painful, horrible, violating experience. So that's where my causal is. Except, it's the, do you see what I mean? That's the causal. Like when you came into your mum, she had some emotion about something and that's the seed of your causal now. So for me, when I came in, there's my causal created. So it's, it's, but the memory's there. So I have to experience the memory with this sort of filter from my mum. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does, but I'm struggling with it for some reason. But I don't, I won't wait <laughs> let you keep going with it. Okay. That's your spirit friends, Josh. Hi Mary, I don't know if this is too personal or, but 
if you want to be triggered. <laughs> I, um, I don't understand why or how your friends have abandoned you. Yeah. Well, it's probably not fair to say that they've abandoned me. Um, I've had a lot of stuff going on about fear of rejection as well. So I've really kept it all to myself for a long time. Of what I was experiencing, um, even still, I'm pretty bad at saying my boyfriend's Jesus. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's a big thing to say, isn't it? <laughs> so I think um, it's probably more fair to say that I've had a lot of fear. So that's projected at them, which is not loving. Um, I've been very tentative with them. When I have opened up to them about it, usually one of a few things happens. They're either... Um, they, they, their own injuries around religion get triggered and so they just sort of step back a little bit. No one's ever gone to me, y you're dead to me or you're barred or, you know, um, but they just sort of step back. Um, or some of them have um, an interaction with AJ and I and there's a lot of truth there and that triggers some stuff for them and then they feel uncomfortable being around that level of truth so they step back a bit so um, yeah so it's it's more like that or they just feel like they can't relate I'm talking about God and truth and love and they're talking about clubbing or you know, or they're not all like that some of them are in uh, foreign countries helping refugees um, but they just can't quite get what I'm on about and that's probably because I haven't been very good at talking about it as well. Yeah. Nearly enough from me. I think Jen's there and Lolene. Thank you, Mary. Um, could you talk about your... A couple of times ago I heard you talk about receiving the divine truth. Could you talk about what that feels for you and like what f receiving divine love feels feels like for you? Um, receiving divine love for me feels really overwhelmingly beautiful and usually I'm crying. Um, and keep in mind that I have been blocking this experience pretty solidly. So Lily's got her experiments going on and I'm like, I don't know if I qualify. <laughs> um, um, so it just feels like love, unconditional love that is so beautiful and overwhelming and I feel unworthy of it and so I cry. Um, truth just... When I met AJ and we started talking, it was pretty amazing, hey? Like, I just knew it. Like, he'd say it and I'd finish his sentence. Or he'd, he'd like, um, be to... I, and I had no idea about the teaching. But we went through the way of the heart together in our first week together and we were like, yeah, but this really means this and that is about that. And, and I, I knew it somewhere inside of me already. And... Um, and I could see where people were, were not getting it and were getting it and really early on. Yeah. Yeah. Lauren, did you want to ask a question? Um, Mary, you mentioned earlier that... Um, when you died, uh, you recall some of your memory of uh, when you passed in the spirit world. Um, could you relate any of that to us? I remember um, feeling 
I remember arriving with a lot of feelings of um, a lot of my man stuff unresolved. So in a lot of grief and some anger when I passed. And um, the events around my death were pretty horrific, um, sexually and physically. And so I think I had a lot of emotion in, th in that. And that was a part of my law of attraction of stuff I hadn't resolved, obviously. Um, and so when I passed, oh, I feel like I needed a l some time to, to work through. I feel like I had a connection with God when I passed and I was teaching and these things. But I feel like there was a lot of unresolved stuff around men and violence and uh, feeling violated and that kind of thing. And so I, I just remember being in a reasonably dark place with a lot of grief. I remember um, AJ coming to find me too. So. <laughs> That's just more emotional of feeling having been apart for too long and having had a longing for him for so long and then finally being with him was really beautiful. Hi, Mary. I understand that you're channeling nowadays. Yeah. Yeah, I got outed. I wasn't ready for that. Yeah. And I'm just I'm just wondering uh, if you're tapping into any of the beings that were around when you were here before and if you're having associative memories with any of these beings. I think, to be honest, Ray, I have been blocking that quite a bit because I've been blocking my experience okay. of the memories. Um, Monica has channeled for us, or for, not for us, she just channeled some spirits that were around and they were, um, they were from that time and very attacking of me. Um, attacking? Yeah, because of, uh, they disapproved of the connection um, between us and because I was the dirty fallen woman who tainted the Messiah, that kind of, uh, yeah. full on, hey. <laughs> uh. <laughs> who would have ever thought I would be standing in front of a room of 200 people talking about tainting the Messiah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, not channeling any of those spirits. And I'm very tentative medium. I'm not very uh, confident. Um, I've just had a few experiences that have, spirits have come through really strongly. And they've been, I think AJ talked about the group of nuns um, who were really hooking into a lot of my stuff around sexuality and... God and um, yeah, some other people that I picked up along the way around the world mm -hmm. <laughs> who've just been hanging out with me. Yeah, okay. yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> causing strife mainly. Uh, you yeah, better save those other ones for later. You know. Yeah. Thanks, Mary. If that's uh, yeah. That might, that might be me for the day then. Oh, no, sorry, sorry, was there someone else? Oh, well, I didn't put my hand up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, Mary, I'm wondering if you could share with us present time some of your desires around teaching um, the divine path and just any ideas and, you know, your desires outside of um, AJ. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for asking that. I wanted to talk about that, so that's good. Um, firstly, there's nothing outside of AJ. Well, no, you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I have been feeling really strongly lately that I would like to find... Um, part of what I'm doing right now is uh, stepping forth and saying, here I am, and this is very much my journey, and it's not controlled by this man. Um, because I, I have received a lot of projection, uh, especially from my family, that I'm being controlled. And um, that was a great trigger. <laughs> um, but um, 
for me, this is a really big journey and I have so much passion for this path. And uh, so I, I wanted to step forward and share that with everyone. Um, and I want to start doing some stuff with whoever wants to around... Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm really interested in um, getting together and um, especially for some of you who are quite stuck, um, doing some things with different modes of interaction, different modes of challenging yourself um, to connect, just to initially connect. I do not want anyone to be dependent on any particular process to get to their emotions because I think there's always a danger in that. If you need something to get to something else, you're going to have to resolve why you need something in the end. But sometimes it's really powerful to use a modality, to use some music, to use some role play, to use some journaling, whatever, to help you access and know, oh, I can get to an emotion and I know what that feels like. Um, so my idea at the moment is to have some little workshops. Um, and I, I've I've got big ideas already um, about getting together in a room and just doing that with people, helping them have some experiences and reflecting on those experiences and how... And really, not only the emotions, but looking at the blocks that we have to what, what we really feel about what it is to be emotional, what we really feel about God, what we really feel about facing truth in our personal life, that kind of thing. Because that's the things that I see where people get a bit, bit stuck. Um, they're the blocks, yeah. So that's what I want to explore. But um, that also doesn't seem like the end. It's just the beginning. Um, and I don't know where the rest will go. Yeah. Uh, part of the reason that I decided to do it separate from AJ is because... Um, I still have big feelings that you all just want to hear from him and he's so good at everything and <laughs> and I want to harness a bit of my own creativity and my own self-expression. So uh, that's what that's about. <laughs> yeah, we were talking this morning that I need to set some dates just so I have a deadline. So I do it, yeah. What? Beautiful segue, Matt, because that's exactly what I was just about to talk about. Um, I wanted to talk to everyone about this issue of men and women. Lots of uh, women come up to me and say, we want to hear more of you, you're the feminine, uh, I can understand what you're saying better than when AJ says it. And um, I, I wanted to say that if that's true, then we have an injury with the masculine. And I'm very passionate, I was saying to more than before, about breaking down this thing we have about men's groups and women's groups. And um, because initially I felt that was great. Yep, let's get women together and help them access some of their man anger because it's a big issue. But then um, I realised you're just reinforcing part of the injury. If you're saying we can only do it together as women because then we're safer. We need to challenge that and we need to be able to be emotionally vulnerable with everyone of every age and every gender. Um, so I really want to break down all kinds of separateness that we have created. Um, so yes, the more men the better. And, and I'm going to have to be really um, owning of my own man stuff because I, I'm not saying that I'm through it all. Um, uh, but I really want men to feel... Uh, that they can experience whatever we do. Yeah. Okay. Is this a question, uh, John? Yeah. Well, the Gold Coast welcomes you and we certainly want to see you as soon as possible, particularly this man with his blockages. Uh, <laughs> thanks, John. I have to work through a lot of um, unworthiness as well. So I know Nina's eagerly anticipating me not being unworthy. <laughs> I'm pretty humbled by all of you. I think you're all really amazing. So for me to say, okay, I have something to teach is still a new thing for me, yeah. Just 
one more question. Uh, Mary, I'm very touched by your presence, and I don't have a questions, but um, uh, I just feel like crying when I hear you. And I, I went into the kitchen, I heard your voice, and it was just touching. I think the whole whole atmosphere, the whole um, vibration here. So thank you very much for you being here and share with us. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Brian. Mary, I'm a bit tentative too, but um, I think there's going to be, um, oh, my feeling is that there's already a few male spirits around to uh, work with you. That's my feeling at the moment. Yes, and I, I definitely know that. I'm just working on um, opening to my brothers in the celestial kingdom. Yeah. I wanted to say it. Thanks, to, to deal with my tentativeness. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, that's the warm up for today. <laughs> Thank you so much for your support and love. I just am overwhelmed. Thank you so much. Don't I, don't I get the tissues? <laughs> uh, now I'm all emotional because I was crying through most of what Mary was saying. So uh, we'll see how I go today. <laughs> yeah, I think I need the tissues. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to say some things um, about Mary's life. Um, obviously, obviously, I know a lot more about Mary's life um, than even, particularly her life in the first century and in the spirit world, than sometimes Mary knows. And so um, we made sort of a deal early on, as she mentioned, that I wouldn't say any of those things to her so that she could have her own experience. And with all of the 14 um, who have returned, I do the same thing. Um, and the reason why I do that is, is that really it's a very personal, emotional experience. And, and when a person goes through this personal, emotional experience, they then can't blame me <laughs> <laughs> afterwards and say, oh, well, AJ prepped me for all of that. Um, now, because of that, obviously, um, there's been many memories that I have about Mary's life that um, obviously I could share, but, but because of wanting to wait for Mary to go through those particular things herself, um, I don't wish to share them. Um, and, and we only usually discuss them together after Mary has gone through the emotions regarding what she remembers, and then we, we talk together about um, she often then talk about my side of it. It's a bit like with every single person, including all of your life, every person who shared your life will have a different perspective of what happened to you that is actually very, very different to what happened to you from your perspective. Right? And so, so often myself and Mary have two very different perspectives of the same event. Uh, that we remember from the first century experience. So obviously my perspective, for example, of my passing um, is very, very different to Mary's perspective of my passing. And, uh, and Mary has, in her presentation today to you, obviously hasn't shared very much of what she does remember. And that's something that Mary is working her way through in terms of being more open and direct and honest about um, 
her own experience. And, um, and so that is a part of this process for her too, is growing through this experience of being brave enough even to share to others, share with others. The reason why that's uh, important is because when, when you're speaking about a first century existence like we're speaking, um, obviously there's a lot of judgment and criticism and anger and resentment and all sorts of emotions that get projected at you. And so it's very, very hard then to speak openly about a life that uh, the majority of people you finish up speaking to f uh, are very close towards hearing anything about. And not so much, some, sometimes not so much close, but also have a lot of projections about, you know, anger based projections oftentimes and rage based projections about even our saying who we are. And so that obviously has an effect on our ability to, to be open. And what we're trying to both work through is this um, get, getting through these emotions so that we can be completely open and completely honest and completely forthright with what has happened in our entire lives um, without being afraid of having no friends at the end of it or without being afraid of having you know, lots of different anger projections or you know, afraid of having religions attack us afraid of having um, all of these different experiences. Obviously, over the last five years, I've had a lot of personal attack. Um, and that's helped to a degree um, in the sense that once I met Mary, obviously a lot of the people that have exhausted their personal attack of me um, and so have not, not attacked Mary as much. That being said, many people started attacking Mary once Mary met me. And so, and when I say attacking her verbally, uh, being very abusive of her, and um, and then abusive of myself as well, and so we've had to work through a lot of those emotions too. And so, um, in, from my perspective, um, like I can feel a lot of the events that Mary was talking about, and the reason why I was sitting crying there in the corner. <laughs> Um, is because uh, you know I can remember my perspective about the events that many of you questioned her about just during her presentation. Which sort of brings me to the subject that I wanted to discuss with you today. You could say that this is going to be the topic of the discussion today for the rest of the day. And by the way, any questions are fine. The reason why I wanted to talk about this with you is because um, many of you will not realise that how many different emotions you have about me saying um, who I am to you. And, uh, and I wanted to discuss with you today um, a lot of the emotions that get projected at Mary and myself because of the statements of my own identity initially and then now Mary um, stating about her identity. And what I would like to do is instead of looking at it from a perspective of like how I feel about it, uh, which you can question me about if you, feel, if you feel you want to, I wanted to more address the issues of your own or the emotions of those people that are projecting these particular things at us. Because actually there's this whole group of very, very large emotions that are actually hidden under the surface of different projections that come to myself or to Mary as a, as a result just of us saying who our identity, what our identity is. And what I would like to do is start actually confronting some of those emotions within you. The reason why I'd like to do that is because what we're finding is that because of our identity we get treated very, very differently than what many of you expect we would get treated and also what, than what uh, many people accuse us of being treated 
uh, when it comes to people talking about us on the internet and so forth. You see, most of the time, everybody, until I say those words, those first two, that I'm Jesus, or my, I don't go by the term Jesus myself very much, like in my first century life, of, I was Yeshua. Um, so for me, my personal name is Yeshua. Um, and Jesus just being sort of the anglicised version of that. But when I say those words, the amount of different emotions a person experiences just by me saying those particular words is quite intense for, for most people when I'm particularly in, a, in, a, inter, when I'm in an interaction with them or even if I've never met them before. So what we're finding is that there's just so many people who've never even met me or Mary and have never listened to a single discussion we've ever had in one of these forums or anything like that. And as soon as they hear that I'm saying that, there's all of a sudden rage, anger, like condescension, all sorts of different emotions. And what I would like to do is start to address some of these emotions in terms of what happens inside of people when, these, when just a simple statement is made. Now, to me, it's just a simple statement. Now, I know when you hear a person say that they're Jesus, obviously it's not quite a simple statement on the receiving end of that statement, right? But um, for me, it's just a simple statement of my own identity. Um, but it's amazing how differently I get treated from the moment of making that statement. Now, many of you will assume that I'd get, be treated better from, the st from making that statement. Well, that's not actually true. From the moment of making that statement, I go from being treated like a sane, rational person who a person can have an intelligent conversation with to quite the opposite thing occurring in, in almost every case initially. And if you cast your mind back to the very first time you personally heard that statement, um, obviously you had different emotions come up. Now, for many what happens, so if you're the person here on earth, so you're the person here on earth, many times you've got a celestial spirit guides, right? Whatever, whatever agenda. And so when I make a statement, I'm Jesus, oftentimes what happens is the person feels a big flush of very powerful, strong energy from their celestial spirit guides. And, and then the person goes along and says, oh, yeah, I know you are. Like, I've had that happen, like, thousands of times, literally, um, where people say, yes, I know you are. Now, you don't know I am, is the first thing I would like to state. They know I am, and they're telling you through an emotion that's passing through you. But that doesn't mean that you've resolved the issue inside of yourself emotionally. Right? And this is why many people have that first flush of, of yes, this is true. And then when, within a week sometimes, they've been in a rage with me and continued in the rage till this day. Right? Because what happens is the first flush of energy happens and the feeling of confirmation flows through the person, but then the person has their own emotions, right, to work their way through. Now, what does a celestial spirit do with your emotions? What they do is they try to help you and assist you work through your own emotions. They're not going to continue giving you confirmation all the time because they want you to get to the state where you sort it out for yourself without needing confirmation from somebody else. Does that make sense? So this issue is uh, of, as to my identity, this issue is an issue that sooner or later you are going to have to sort out for yourself. And I want to talk today about why you're going to have to sort it out. Right? Because sooner or later what's going to happen, and this is one of the things that will occur, <laughs> is that you're going to get so much pressure on this particular issue that you're going to have to sort it out or, or not see it anymore, basically. Right? Now, many of you have already started having that happen in your personal lives, have you not? Yep. So, you know, you tell, you know, a relative, like, 
a daughter, a son, a mother, a father. Oh, you know, there's this guy who says he's Jesus and I'm going along to his seminars. You don't even say at that point that you even think he is. All you just say is you're going along to this presentation of this guy who says he is. And all of a sudden what starts happening? Without them knowing what I'm talking about, without them understanding a single word, without even attempting to know what is the initial th response generally. Missy. There's all this stuff that comes at you, isn't there? All this emotional stuff, of condescension, how can you do this, you're an idiot, he's just a cult leader, what would you want him to do, and so forth and so forth and so forth. And all this stuff just gets hammered at you emotionally, doesn't it? You notice that? Now what's happening is that that is your law of attraction of things to work through with regard to all of these issues, you see. And the key is to actually acknowledge that this is my law of attraction. For many of you, many of you are actually preventing your law of attraction on the issue. And you know how you do that. Oh, I'm going to see this seminar of this some guy. You know, it's really, really interesting. You should come along. And then you look through the DVDs. Which one does AJ say he's Jesus in? You know, put those, put those aside, right? And, and Mary's done this herself. Like recently, we were going to give a DVD to one of her friends. And she said, I'm oh, not that one, not that one, not that one. <laughs> <laughs> there happens to be this DVD on the law of attraction that I did that none of you have seen yet, uh, which was about uh, three and a half, four years ago now, um, and uh, and the majority of you would never have seen it because it's uh, an excellent presentation. It's, it's a very informal. Yes, yeah, in Texas it was done. It was a very informal presentation that I did, sitting down basically or kneeling down most of the time, and um, and. Throughout the entire thing, I don't say that I'm Jesus. So that's very helpful if you want to. <laughs> I don't think there's too many since then, is there? Like, but anyway, I'm sorry about that. There's not much I can do about that. But you can see what happens is, is what's happening emotionally is that we are afraid even of addressing the fact of what I'm saying about myself. You're hearing all this information, but you're afraid to even address it with your friends. Now, why are you afraid? The reason why we're afraid is because we have emotions that we know that we feel inside of ourselves and we also know that they're probably going to project their doubts and their attack and their, you know, their thinking our stu we're stupid and we're all these different things and we're just going to get hammered with it. And so what do we do when we know we're going to get hammered with something? What we do generally is we avoid it. Now, that might be great for you to feel happy on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's not ever going to let you deal with the emotions that cause you to not be at one with God. Can you see that? Because while I avoid issues by skirting around my law of attraction, you know, so you have to be a pretty good dancer to do that, really, in the end of it, because God's, God's designed the law perfectly, right? So you think you can get away with it one way, but sooner or later it's going to come to you. But often what we do at the beginning is we skirt around this and skirt around that and skirt around this and skirt around that. And really what we're trying to do is skirt around our own resolution of our own doubts and our own resolution of our own emotions on the matter. That's really what we're trying to do. Now, what's going to happen down the track? Of course these things are going to be triggered in you. Right? So what's happened for many people is many people have had this initial realisation. They say, oh, all right, we've got to go. They decide, oh, we've got to go and hear Jesus have a chat. So you hear Jesus have a chat for a week, or two weeks, three. Sounds pretty good, particularly when you hear the first bit, you know, the, the whole secrets of the universe type discussion that we've had, you know, with all of the summary of what's going on. And, you're feeling these emotions of the soul feeling like, wow, this is totally different to what I've felt before. And then uh, and we feel that and that passes through us and we start feeling quite enthusiastic. And the first person we tell, <laughs> generally, <laughs> says, what? What are you? You know, we show them the DVD. Some of you have had this experience. You give them the first DVD overview of the universe within 10 or 15 minutes. I'm not watching that anymore because that's the period of time it takes for me to say <laughs> who I am, right? <laughs> and, and the majority of the times I've had a lot of trouble saying who I am. Like the last one presentation that I did, which was in the Gold Coast where I, where I said right at the front, you know, the overview of the universe discussion, I was so afraid about talking about who I was in that, in that uh, uh, discussion because I wasn't afraid because of any of the audience. 
I was afraid because my darling soulmate uh, over there um, was projecting so much stuff at me that day about me, <laughs> about me saying it that I was just like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> and and we talked about it that evening, and uh, and um, and and then the next day, of course, it was it was fairly different because Mary worked through quite a lot of emotions as a result of that. And so a lot of these presentations are actually the. Re are actually triggering myself and Mary um, more than they trigger you. Believe that or not, <laughs> as you may, but um, I know many of you walk away from a presentation going, oh boy, I don't know if I can go to another one. <laughs> There's too much truth in the previous lots. But um, we have this constant emotional interaction going on as well, where we're dealing with our emotions in these presentations. Now, one of my major emotions that I have still that I'm working my way through is this deep uh, uh, distress that I have about uh, the loss of, of perfection. Um, and uh, um, it's so hard to describe um, because it's, uh, it's so hard for you to picture what it's like to live in a place like the 22nd sphere and then to come here, here on earth and experience this place in, in immediate contrast. It's one thing to grow into a place, you know, like, so for the majority of us uh, who have not reincarnated, you, you come from the sixth fear condition around about, a natural love condition, perfect natural love condition, and you come into the human form. So obviously there's still trauma involved in the process of incarnation, but the trauma of that and also remember, you don't have a consciousness of your prior existence. And many of you, by the way, who feel you have, have only had your spirit friends telling you about the condition before you came here. But anyway, the, you don't have a prior experience of the condition. So when you come, while you have emotional trauma, there's not a memory of what you've lost so much. And, uh, but for myself and Mary and all the others of the 14, there's these terrifying memories of, of what we lost. And uh, that's, for me, one of my biggest emotions and I'm still working my way through. And in the process of working my way through that emotion, I'm very conscious of my own um, inadequacies. Um, and and so, um, so when I go up to a person and say I'm Jesus, of course, uh, there's just a barrage of stuff that comes from most person, people about me making that statement. Well, what do you imagine Jesus to be compared to what I am? You see, for most of you, if, if somebody had said, oh, Jesus is on the earth, um, you should go and see him before you met me, what would you have imagined Jesus to be while he was on the earth? It's very different to what you see me being most for most of you, isn't it? So in fact, what do you imagine it's like? You imagine that, you know, I'd be doing miracle healing, for example, wouldn't you? From the majority of people. You could at least wear a white robe. I could at least yeah. <laughs> the Apostle John told me I couldn't do that, so <laughs> he told me if I do that then he'll disown me immediately. <laughs> But anyway, the, the, um, what I wanted to do is actually go through some of these emotions with you that get projected and, um, and discuss with you their source. What emotions, what are the causal emotions within us that cause us to have these expectations? So, so let's firstly address the expectations. All right. Whenever an expectation, by the way, and this is something to bear in mind with your regard to your emotional processing, whenever you have an expectation that is not emotionally fulfilled, you will guaranteed get angry. So, whenever we have an expectation of anyone around us that does not get fulfilled by that individual, we ourselves will get into a state of anger or rage. Now let's look at the 
the degrees of emotion, if you like. Remember, most of our emotion comes from f our feelings of grief, right? Which, the, by the way, the majority of us still do not want to feel. There are literally thousands and thousands of methods that mankind has created to help you feel your emotions. And do you know what I feel about all of them? None of them are going to be as good as the method God created. And in fact, for a person on earth to believe that they can create a method that helps them get through emotion better than the way God designed, there is a lot of arrogance in that. Can you see that? Now, what was the way God designed? What, well, you look at a little child. When the child is in a state of grief, what does it just do? It cries and cries and cries and cries and cries until the grief is done. Doesn't it? Isn't that what it does? It's so simple. That's what it does. But, you know, what we want to do is we want to circumnavigate the process of grief. Right? We want to actually create all these other ways, you know, like that are going to just help me grieve for five minutes or do it for an hour and it's done, or, or all these different things. That's what we want to do. We create all these methods. Mankind creates all these methods. And in, really, in reality, what we're working through is our blockages to grief. Because when you get to the state where you're really willing to feel your grief, you will just do what a child does. And by the way, that is what God created you to do. And if you think you can in create or invent a process that is better than the way God created, then we've got to deal with a lot of a lack of humility and a, and a lot of arrogance that's within us if we feel that. Does that make sense to everyone? Now, all of these different methods that we have to avoid our grief come from or, or to process our grief in a way that doesn't overwhelm us come from our blockages to grief. All right? Our, all of our blockages are just blocking and stopping this healing process. Now, a lot of the blockages uh, to grief, when you, when you analyse them, you could really just rub out the word blocks and you could put in there the word fear. Right? All of your blockages to grief and all of your desires to have techniques to not feel your emotions fully, just like a child would, come from some kind of fear inside of us. Does that make sense? So some kind of fear is driving us to try to fully, or try to avoid the process of full release or full experience of our grief. Now this gets dumped on children from the time before they're born. So once they're born, a cry child is crying. And so what do we do? We pick up the child and we rock the child. Right? Now I'm not saying don't do this. I'm going to give you another suggestion of what you could do. You rock the child and what are you trying to do in that moment? What's the projection of emotion coming from you? You're distressed about the child crying, are you not? And you're trying right at that moment to stop the child from crying rather than to look at the causal emotion within yourself that created the sadness and grief of the child in the first place. Does that make sense? Because it's, the child is crying because the parent is denying an emotion right at that moment, whatever that emotion is. So I am there denying the emotion of grief within myself and right from the moment of birth I am now also helping the child learn the methods of denying their own like, emotion which happens to actually be a full result of my own denial. Right? So there I am rocking the child. Just the, I don't have to even say anything. At this point I'm projecting the emotion. Please stop, please stop. I can't cope with you crying. Who can't you cope with crying? You can't cope with yourself crying. <laughs> that's what the issue is. And that's why the child's crying. The child is just per perfectly reflecting your own denied emotion right at that instant. And so there, we're there rocking this child, 
calming this child down because we have a fear about our own emotional experience. Can you see that? All right. So this child, and this is the reason why many of you are having trauma in dealing with your emotions. Not because the emotions themselves, but because of the fear that you have about getting to those emotions. This is why, this is the hard part. This part I actually enjoy. Yeah. I don't know about you, but when you get to the grief and to the full experience of the grief, it's amazing the transformational results that happen within a short, few short hours in your entire life, right? But dealing with fears, man, I have spent months, if not sometimes years, dealing with one fear about one issue, right? And many of you are having the same struggle, right? All right. But mankind's not happy with just one layer of denial, right? <laughs> because, you know, fear doesn't look very pretty, does it? How many of us have judgment about fear? You know, I'm a tough guy. I wouldn't cry about something. I'm not afraid. Don't tell me I'm afraid. So what we do is we start piling on other layers of denial. We deny our fear through a process which turns into this anger place. And so whenever somebody triggers our grief or our fear now, we have a defensive response that's automatic within us that allows us to circumnavigate both our fear and our grief. Now, how many of us actually like experiencing fear? That's pretty hard to feel, isn't it? Like, you start being terrified and you shake and like it's really difficult to actually get through fear from an experiential perspective. And so we'd like, we don't want to be in that state. So what we want to do is create a powerful state, a state where we feel strong and under control, everything inside of our power. So we create this anger state. Now for most of us, this anger state is very much a, like what you would call a passive-aggressive anger, right? where, where we don't actually go out and yell and scream at somebody because what happens with society now about that? Oh, that's not on either. So we're not allowed to do this either, really. You know? It's only the weak people who do that. Right? So where do we go with that now? Well, we've got, we've got to go into total emotional suppression, right? Is it two Ps? Yeah. Yeah. Total emotional suppression. Depression, if you like. Right? Where we're numb now emotionally. And in this state, we can manufacture some incredible scenarios intellectually inside of ourselves. We can go along and do a heap of meditation and whatever else and zen out and experience what we call bliss, you know. Oh, I was at peace with the universe and I'm going, geez, you're not at peace with the universe. If you could feel your emotions, right, you'd realise you're not at peace with the universe. Like, you know. So wh why do we have all these layers? We have all these layers because in the end we want to avoid this. That's what it's all done. It's all just to con constructed to avoid the pain. What we view, and by the way, it's what we view as the pain of grief. Because actually, once you start getting through all of this, you realise that actually grief is not as painful as you think or that you fear. Right? But we have this belief that the pain of grief is the worst possible thing we could ever experience. And so what we've done is we've constructed this tower. And then some idiot comes along, right, and stands in front of you and says, oh, I'm Jesus. <laughs> and there's all this truth, right? There's all this truth that just happens to be inside of me somehow. And and straight away, what, I, what am I going to do? I'm going to connect to this person on lots of different layers of my own suppression of emotion. Can you see that? So, if I'm in this place of suppression, what am I going to do with that? I am going to get into a rage with him. 
How dare he say he's Jesus? He's just a normal man. Well, yes, of course, that's what I'm saying. I am. Right? But, but how many people do you see the, like, writing down on the internet that yeah, he's just saying he's a normal man, right? Aside from those people who know and have heard, no, he's saying he's something different. He's saying he's God, some of them think. And some of, do you know what I mean? Can, does this replay any memories about what the Bible said about my first century life to you? Like, like if I give you some examples, he's saying he's Jesus, right? Here's some comments that I've had. Jesus would never do what you do. Okay. Well, that's presupposing a lot of things. It, there's a lot of illogical logic in what I get presented, right? Firstly, have you ever met Jesus before? <laughs> well, if you haven't ever met Jesus before, how in the hell would you know what he was going to do? Right? And even if you had met him before, do you know even what your wife is going to do next week? And that's someone you know or your husband, right? Do you know what they're going to do next week? A lot of times we don't, and that's why we have our arguments and fights, right? Because they didn't do what we, what, what we expected, right? And so, and so how would you then know what Jesus is going to do next week? How would you know? It's totally illogical to base your judgment of whether I'm Jesus or not on a statement like that. Can you see that? Totally illogical. But let's go take that and grab the anger. So now what we do? Jesus would never have said that to me. He would never have said that to me. So somebody comes up and I say, oh, actually you've got some injuries with your mother and actually you hate your mother's guts right at the moment, right? That's how it is. That's how you feel inside. Jesus would never have said that to me. Like, <laughs> off they go. Like, you know, how dare he say that? You know, I don't hate my mother. It's, you know, and, I, and so I never see them again. There's been thousands and thousands of people that I've met that I've never seen again. And by the way, there's been <coughs> billions of people that I've met in 2,000 years that I've never seen again. Right? Because they've asked Jesus to come, so Jesus comes and they say, you don't look like Jesus to me. Okay, how is Jesus meant to look like? You know, I don't, like, do I turn on this button and change my appearance so I look now how you want, to, want me to look? You know, so, so this is the thing. Is like, a lot of these statements are totally illogical when you think about it. Like, let's say if I came along to one of these presentations and I had all my hair shorn off, right? I had a number four like I used to have. <laughs> Well, you don't look like Jesus now. I can't accept anything you've got to say, right? <laughs> like, a lot of these things are totally illogical in, in, if we think about them. But the problem is that most of the statements that people are saying to me, they never think about. Right? Because they're not interested in thinking about them. They're feeling them. Yeah. Right? So, what's one of your fears when I say I'm Jesus? Oh, you're going to want to control me now. You know, you've been controlled by religion a lot of your life, right? And a lot of you have had a Christian religious background, or your parents have. So you've been controlled by a Christian religious background a lot of your life. Even your holiday period is about it. Like, these are the Christmas holidays, are they not? You're getting controlled by my life. Can you see that? Why can't you have holidays when you want them? Why do they have to be Christmas time? Well, now we've got this whole thing where we justify, oh, it's a time when the family gets together, isn't it wonderful, all that stuff. But in reality, we're being controlled by what somebody said has happened in my life. Right? That's what's happening. So, of course, this man comes along and he says, he's Jesus, what are you going to feel for many of us? A fear of being controlled by this man. Right? And let's kick that off further. I've got a fear of being controlled by this man, so how do I defend this fear? Oh, he's a cult leader. All right? That's a good way to defend the, the fear, isn't it? Don't you see that? If I can say he's a cult leader, what's the word cult connotate to everyone on the planet pretty much? Kool-Aid. Yeah, yeah Kool-Aid, Jim Jones, all that stuff, right? That's what we think of. And so we go down the track of saying, oh, you know, sooner or later, like I've seen things written on the net, Recently, 
um, not that I look at it very often, but um, where I've had it pointed out to me that, that people are saying, you know, sooner or later he's going to ask you to drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> okay, like, <laughs> like, fine, if that's what you feel, but what's the, what's the fear? That's the fear, can you see that? Like a comment like that is just a fear-based comment of an unresolved fear within the person. Like if you knew me, like, gee, I have trouble killing, killing anything. How would I ask thousands of people to drink some Kool-Aid, right? This, this is impossible. And, and yet, because of the fear that is within the person, unresolved fear, that's just been based on their life and, and it's a fear of feeling control. They need to feel the underlying emotional grief of being controlled most of their life by religion. Like you go to America and it's amazing there now. Like here in Australia we don't understand now to, to a large degree how much control there is in other countries with regard to religion. Now here we have a pretty free religious society, don't we? We can pretty much be whatever we want. And sure, groups of people may criticise us, you know, so if you're a Pentecostal born-again Christian, then a whole group of people might criticise you. If you're a Muslim, a whole group of people might criticise you. If you're a New Age, a whole group of people might criticise you. But in the end, a lot of the criticism here in Australia is pretty mild, isn't it, compared to what you see happening in other countries where people get burnt for their, for their belief where people get killed for their belief. If you're in a family and you had change your belief that you actually risk your own life doing it from the family, let alone the society. Right? So here in Australia we have a relative, like fairly large degree of freedom on religious issues. But you go to a place like in the USA where still, I think it's still 70 or so percent of people are still heavily involved in going to church every weekend, Christian church. You imagine, like, somebody comes along who says he's Jesus. You imagine what that's going to have an effect on in a, in a society like that? Like, huge amounts of stuff coming up there. And so, so what we finish up doing is we finish up living in our fear about the issue. Mary, you wanted to say? You need to turn that on. I just wanted to point out that it's actually... Like it's so counter-logical because of what you're actually teaching. Ironically, it's the grief about being controlled that makes people susceptible to, to control. control. It, it, for me, if you told me to drink Kool-Aid, I'd laugh at you and go, okay, you can have it. Do you know what I mean? When you so, say Jesus has gone nuts now and I don't yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'd want to talk to you about your emotions. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> but it's just sort of counter-logical to say that you want to control people when you're actually teaching people to um, look at the ways that um, their, you know, that their emotions are running them yeah. in a disempowered way. Yeah, and I, I laugh a lot of times. When, on the way back from Mackay, um, myself and Mary had a discussion in the car. We went to Mackay a few weeks ago. By the way, it was a good trip and, and we had a lot of enjoyable pre things in the presentation there. But um, on the way back home, I just went into this, uh, I suppose you'd call it um, a sort of quasi-angry uh, place of, um, where I was sarcastically um, addressing all of the issues that are aimed at me with regard to the criticisms about my identity. And... and I just, we should have taped it because I was off. <laughs> it was pretty funny. Yeah, Mary got a lot of laugh out of it. And um, it was like, uh, it I just amazes me a lot of the things that are said about, about uh, myself and Mary and so forth, where people have got no idea about the emotions that are actually going on within them that are getting suppressed as they're making those statements. And what I would like you to do, and this is why, one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this with you today, is because I'd like you to start confronting those emotions. Not for the sake of believing or not believing who I am, but for the sake of you releasing the emotion. Because the emotion, like if you have a fear of being controlled by some religious figure, right, that's going to present, prevent you from becoming at one with God. Just that one fear. So it needs to be dealt with at some point. Can you see that? 
If you have a fear of being controlled by anyone, then you have some grief to release about control. And also, AJ... You can join uh, me up here, <laughs> You can join me up here. Come on. It's nearly break time. It's nearly break time. That's not an excuse to avoid it. <laughs> now you've forgotten what you wanted to say. <laughs> no, I just wanted to... One of the things that strikes me a lot is um, how people feel that because AJ says he's Jesus, then it's okay to be unloving to him. If he was just a regular Joe, they would certainly question... I, I feel that people would question their um, behaviour towards someone who was teaching them something um, a lot more than they do. And that's because of what you're explaining here, a lot of their fears being triggered and them not wanting to feel about it. Mm. But also it's often an excuse to disregard where they've come so far. Mm. Um, if they haven't resolved a lot of their fears, then they just chuck everything out. Um, mm. Yeah, I don't know if I explained that well, but... That's do you get what I mean? Yeah, yeah, like, do you understand what Mary is saying there? Like, like if I, if I was uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer or Deepak Chopra and I started presenting this, all this truth to you, right? Truth, by the way, that, you know, has been tested as much, much higher in its, in its uh, what they call consciousness than, than any, anything else that's ever been presented on the earth. And, it was, and if it was Deepak Chopra doing it, who has his ten minders around him, who you never get to see the person themselves in their private life at all, right? how do you feel spending some time with him would be like for you? You'd be like, whoa, this is, I got to talk with Deepak, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm talking, this is true. Many of you had this emotion before you met me, right? Where somebody comes along who is a guru that you that you respected, you know, and to get some audience time with that person is just like awesome, isn't it? Like power, and you you go well. It's exactly the opposite as to how I get treated. Most people come up and actually say to me how much of an idiot I am when they first meet me. A lot of people do that, right? And a lot of people go con condescending. And a lot of people say to me, "Yeah, but you must be doing this for alter you know, ulterior motives." Well, what's my interior motive? I've been doing it for five, six years now. What's my interior motive? Oh, well, I don't know what it is yet, but I'll work it out. Oh, you'll find, I'll find your real motive sooner or later. <laughs> like I've had that said to me quite often too. Why is that? Because they're really just in fear and then dictated to by that fear, they feel then that they can treat me in an unloving way as a result. But I don't treat them in that way. I, I don't say, what's your name? Oh, John Blow, you know. Oh, no, I don't agree with that. Your name's not that at all. Like, your name's actually this, and what else do you, can you tell me about your life? Oh, yeah, you know, my father hurt me when I was little, you know, abused me. No, that never happened. Uh, you don't need to worry about that. Like, that never happened. What do you think? You, you're an idiot if you think that. Like, I never say those things to the person. I never even say them when I know that the person had an experience that they don't remember yet, let alone when I, you know, if listening to their experience. And yet that gets said to me constantly. Like, how can that be? That's not possible. You've had a question for some time, Matt, so, and then we'll go across to Monique over there. So, if we could have the mic down across to Monique down there. <coughs> I, how are you going? I just wonder how the fact that you don't ask for money changes the projections and things. And, you know, some of those others you've <coughs> mentioned, like, you know, what's his name? Deepak. Deepak, yeah. Yeah, those guys ask for considerable sums. Yeah, yeah. If you had a sort of like a 20-person audience with Deepak, you'd be paying like two to $5,000 a pop. So, and, um, and nobody accuses him of having power and control issues. And nobody accuses him of being a money ripoff either. Right? But I get accused of that constantly. Yeah. So, so I find that very interesting how, um, yeah, if I was another person, if I wasn't claiming to be Jesus, and this is, a, this is one thing I'd like to raise with you. If I wasn't claiming to be Jesus, I can guarantee to you 
that the truth that is being taught, there'd be tens of thousands of people coming along to. If just because I'm claiming to be Jesus, it's totally different. Now, <laughs> I just have I got an emotional investment in being Jesus, do you think? <laughs> Right. So I sat down when I heard about all, you know, when I, you know, remembered all of the stuff about <coughs> myself, and I'm going, oh my God! Like, <laughs> I'm actually going to have to say who I am, and do you think anybody's going to listen to that? Like, this is like five or six years ago now. Do you think anybody's going to listen to that? Oh my God! Like, my life was just getting together. And now I was looking at, like, seeing the real emotional response, you see. See, a lot of times people think that because I'm saying I'm Jesus, that means that I want glory and I want power and I want control. Honestly, you try saying you're Jesus and see how much glory and power and control you get. You don't, you don't get any, I can guarantee you. Because everyone is suspicious. Everyone. Just by you saying that. Does that make sense? And, and so, so if I had an emotional investment in getting money out of you, right, I would certainly not be saying that I'm Jesus. Right? It would be the last thing to say, trust me. <laughs> and if I had an emotional investment in having control over your life, I certainly would not be saying I'm Jesus. Right? Because how does, it, does anyone want to listen to a guy who's saying they're Jesus? You know, I've had said to me almost, like I can't remember the amount of times I've had this said to me, there are thousands and thousands of Jesus in mental asylums. Why aren't you in one? <laughs> right? <laughs> and that's why I said, well, one of us has to be. <laughs> uh, which is not entirely logical, but it's just as logical as what they're saying. <laughs> yeah. so, so, you know, in the end, uh, we talk about how to resolve some of these emotions as this talk progresses after the break. But what I wanted to raise with you is this issue because what I'm finding is that I get treated, and in fact, you will get treated as well just by association with me you will get treated in a much worse way than if I wasn't, than if you would if I wasn't saying I was Jesus. Right? And that's the truth, unfortunately. Um, Monique? You actually just answered my question, so okay. thank you. Okay, no worries. Uh, if we have, oh, sorry, Joy, you got the mic? Then we go across there. Two things, um, thinking about Deepak Chopra and Wayne Dyer and speakers like that, there's a lot of public acceptance of those totally. figures. And so I wonder whether a lot of people's fear is, oh, I can't think that, what will people think? So is a lot of the fear about that, like I can't be the one that's different? I can't be the pace setter. I can't yes. be the, somebody who's different than the rest of you. Well, yes. you think about it in your life, how many things do you do in your own life that it are just done to conform to what everyone else mm. thinks you should do. Mm. Now, for the majority of those, that's a huge emotion to work through, isn't it? Like, mm. there is just so many things in our lives that we do because other people think that it's the right thing to do. Mm. And that one single emotion drives many of the comments. So, so what I find is many of the totally logical comments that are aimed at me about my identity are born from deep fears and deep anger within people, not about me personally, mm. because they've never met me personally in most cases, but because of the religious connotations, the political connotations, mm. and even the environmental social connotations in their own life. Mm. And so that's a major creation of most of the emotion. And just by association with me, you will have to confront those same emotions. Which, by the way, you need to confront anyway if you want to become at one with God. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Like, you're going to need to confront this emotion of being different. Because God actually created you to be different, right? Every single one of you is different. And God created you to be different. You know, we've, we've all been put in these boxes. And you do need to deal with this emotion of why you want to be in the box that other people have created for you. 
one of the ways is by being associated with Jesus who's, who's, who's going to trigger that emotion just by association. Mm. And we're, you know, so that after the break we'll talk about some of these emotions that are going to be triggered by association. You had a second question? Yes, I did, thanks. Um, you have said that there are 150 people on the Divine Love Path or so, and, but nobody on the world, in, in the world right now believes that you are Jesus. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm somebody who sits there where I want to believe that you're Jesus mm -hmm. and I'm happy with that thought. Yeah, so, so, so you're saying you want to. Want to. So some of you want to, to right? Yes. Yeah. Um, um, you so I you think it's a great idea, right? Um, <laughs> more than that, I'm willing, that to, Jesus accept, comes I'm willing to accept it. Yeah. I'm willing to accept it. I, I would put to you that you're not. That's what I want to know. I want to know. Yeah. How do you identify what the blocks are? Well, that's what I would like to discuss after our break, actually, if we can identify a lot of the blockages to, to it. Wanting to, by the way, is totally different to actually doing it. Mm. Right? And just because it's a great idea that Jesus comes back, it doesn't mean Jesus is back. Does that make sense? I'm back. <laughs> it doesn't mean that. Right? <laughs> so, so we, we, can, we can go through... We can go through a lot of those things that we desire, and this is in fact what a lot of people are going to aim at you. You just want to believe it, that's why you believe it. You just want to believe there's a God, so you believe there's a God. It's, well, there's so much more than that because it's somewhere, I mean, I just so believe every word that you say. Yeah, but that's so totally different than believing my identity. That's right, and so how does one yep. believe your identity? Yeah, well, this is a very good question which I'll answer. Can, yeah. yeah. I'll answer it later though. Okay. Yeah. Can I can I just say something on that? I'm not mm. to answer the question, but just to talk about my um, feelings about what truth is, um, and how we um, like I feel like when we're at one with God, we'll hear different things and we'll know what's true and what's not because we'll um, be connected with ourselves and with God, and we'll be able to. Um, like we won't have any emotional block to what is truth and what is not. So for me. I, Initially, I was a little triggered about AJ talking about this topic because um, I feel very strongly that we shouldn't ever convince anyone of who we are. Um, but I do feel that um, each of us, as do I, have emotions that are not in harmony with love that prevent me having clarity about this issue. So I am on a mission to deal with those emotions and then the truth will be the truth will enter my soul, as I have experienced on other issues when I have dealt with an emotion that blocks my understanding of what a truth is about any issue, when I release the fear or the hurt or whatever is blocking that, then suddenly I have an experience of what is true. So um, is, is that clear, what I'm saying? Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yep. yeah. AJ, um... Isn't also people's negative reaction to you saying that you're Jesus part of the um, picture? Isn't it also um, your law of attraction? Like when I tell people that you're Jesus, you know, I've got, I know I've got self-esteem issues and people look at me as if I'm crazy and I get all, you know, feel nervous and, and that. But isn't that part of the picture that we're, we're all of us attracting this negative response because of our... Um, unworthiness, and as well as people's projection. Yes, certainly, certainly. And, and I'm, so I'm not saying yeah. that I blame the people for their response. But it's both, isn't it? Both. Certainly. The alchemy of them and us. Certainly. Well, their emotional process is still their emotional yeah. process. The fact that we attract someone who's having that emotional process yeah. is a part of our yeah. law of attraction. But, let, but let's not justify a person's law of attraction with regard to negative emotion. Because, see, one of the things that we often do with the law of attraction is we go down the problem of, we, we make this assumption. We say, all right, if the law of attraction is working perfectly at every single moment, then that means I needed that man to be angry with me before I deal with my fear. So I should thank the man. So I've I should heard thank that the many man. Times. This is where we go intellectually, you know, on the natural love path, right? Now, that isn't actually true. The truth is you do not need anybody to help you confront your fear by acting in an unloving way towards you. Does that make sense? So while it certainly is my law of attraction with regard to my own fe uh, fear of 
Uh, well, in my case, it's my fear of death, uh, not so much death, actually, it's more the fear of being tortured to death that, that um, causes me to go into this state sometimes where I'm not completely open about my own identity, although I'm not, I think since I've been with Mary, I've always been open with my identity. Um, the, that, that's, that is an emotion within me that I still need to work through, my own unworthiness, if you like, or in my case, my own lack of perfection. So I feel embarrassed to say that I'm Jesus because I'm not the person that I used to be, um, that, but, but I am becoming again. Does that make sense? Like That's my feelings within me, is that I'm embarrassed to say who I am. And that embarrassment certainly does attract then people thinking, you know, that I'm an idiot or crazy or whatever else. Mind you, in the first century, I had no embarrassment about saying I was the Messiah. But it still attracted people who were very, very angry with me and wanted to kill me. And the reason why that occurs is because there will always be a conflict in between truth and error until error wants to give up. You see, when you're in a state of truth, you will never give up. Once you actually know the truth inside of your soul, you can't <coughs> give it up anymore. It's not something you can compromise anymore. So even at the threat of your own death or your children's death or any of these terrible events that have been perpetrated by religion in the past um, to help people give up their belief systems, none of those things would have an effect on you if you really felt the truth inside of yourself. Does that make sense? Yeah. AJ, when you've um, completely healed <coughs> of a... The worth, 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 self-worth issues. Yep. Um, you'll still. Does that mean you'll still get the projections when of, you say you're Jesus of because of the the other people's? Um, of course. Anger yes. and fear. But yep. the difference is that I won't be afraid of it anymore. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I, I've got to respect the fact that I've still got to work through my own fear about saying who I am because of this terrible feeling that I have of being embarrassed about saying it, <laughs> and that and it's really a fear of my own embarrassment. Does that make sense? That is my primary emotion. And, and that I need to work my way through that. But when I do work my way through that um, and come out the other end and not feel embarrassed about saying my identity at all, or Mary's or any of the others of the 14 for that matter, and there will still be negative projections because fear, uh, truth and error are always in conflict until error gives up. And in fact, we said that in the pageant messages. If you read a message, there's a message there in the pageant messages that I wrote to James Paget saying that exactly that, that until there will always be a conflict between truth and error until error decides, mankind decides to release the error. So it's until there's no error on the earth? Until there's no error on earth, there will always be a conflict between truth and error. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I was just going to make a point about the law of attraction. You touched on it briefly about. Um, Oh, and I touched on it briefly just then, talking about, um, you know, if, if AJ and I have, a, have an issue between us and I trigger, through my unloving behaviour, I trigger his unworthiness, let's say. So we can, a, a really common, oh, I see this happening even amongst some of you guys sometimes too, and, and I probably was guilty of it in the beginning as well. Um, <coughs> A lot of us say, oh, that's okay because AJ has to work through that issue anyway. He's got unworthiness. And there's, uh, you know, not looking at my own unloving behaviour in that situation. And I've had it with people where um, something has occurred and um, in my own unworthiness I've pointed it out and I've said, but I know that I need to look at that issue as well. And they've gone, yeah, and not really look <laughs> looked at their own behaviour in that situation and I think it's a really natural love thing to go, oh, we'll just thank all the murderers and people and all of that but really I just feel a lot of compassion because um, for people who are uh, committing unloving acts, that's a big issue for their soul that they need to look at, you know. Mm. And so there's a, I think there is a danger of just going, oh, well, that's your law of attraction, that's your law of attraction. Not only for, like, um, when we're at one with God, we're going to want to be loving to everyone, but also we need, we need to be able to look at ourselves, yeah. Mm. Uh, hi, AJ. How you doing? Um, I've been coming to you since about February of this year. Yep. Uh, this time last year I came out of a mental um, hospital. Yep. I um, was suicidal yep. and uh, 
So I therefore was following up with a psychiatrist, yep. you know, and who's got to know me after the, over this year. And the last time I was here, I was in a, you know, fairly um, uh, big state of upheaval. Yeah, emotionally. And I, yeah, and yeah. I came here on the Sunday and I also spent a couple of days with my beautiful friend Jan there. Yeah. And we talked and talked and talked. And so there was a big shift and I'd been to the psychiatrist on the Friday. Yeah. I came back the next week and it was a, like a totally different person he was seeing. Yeah. And he said, oh, I've got so many people, it's, it's murderous, you know. And um, I then told him the truth of a lot of things that I actually hadn't said beforehand. Yeah. And he said to me, and what's given you this wisdom? <laughs> and I went, oh, God. <laughs> well, God certainly has, anyway. <laughs> and um, I said, oh, I go and see this teacher. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and he said, oh, and what sort of teacher? And I, I went, oh, heavens, I've got to speak the truth here. Yeah. And I said, look, it's a long story. How about I just give you some DVDs? It's a good way to get around it, isn't it? <laughs> and Let AJ get uh, himself into trouble. It's fairly, <laughs> I said, it's fairly controversial, <laughs> and I'll just leave it with that. Yeah, yeah. And so I dropped them off to him yesterday, and it was the Narang one where you had said, yeah. I'm Jesus Christ. And I thought, well, that's a really good way of speaking the truth. Yeah. And, um, and at the end of this, he said, I can only say hello and goodbye. And he was with me for a long, longer time than he's ever been. Yeah. And he said to me, he got really excited and he said, look, I teach students in psychiatry. He said, will you come along next year and speak to my students? And yeah, you know, well, that's he said, because that could, um, he said, I just don't understand why people you know, have wonderful lives and don't under, and he said, you know, spiritually it doesn't add up. Yeah, yeah. So who knows what that's going to do. Yeah, and that's the beauty of speaking the truth too, is yeah. you don't know where it's going to lead. Mm. What I love about God's laws is every time you speak the truth, every single one of God's laws is now in harmony with your action. Mm. That's, a, that's an amazing thing when you think about it, because God's got thousands and thousands, like, even physically, there's those thousands and thousands and thousands of laws, right? And then on the spiritual level, there's, there's hundreds of thousands of laws. And on the soul level, there's hundreds of thousands of laws, right? Now, if you think about that, when you're in truth, you have every one of them working in harmony with you. When you're in error, emotional error, so this is emotional truth versus emotional error. When you're in emotional error, you have quite a lot of those laws and often almost all of those laws working in disharmony with you. And there's a lot of power that those laws working in harmony with you bring when you exercise your desire in harmony with truth. You know, I don't, this is not going to, I don't know how this is going to come across, but I've had lots of people say to me that only people who have ever been to psychiatric institutions would ever listen to me. Uh -huh. And uh, obviously many of you have never been to one. Uh, and like I've even had recently people saying that I've been to one, which, by the way, I haven't, just to clarify that. Um, so, you know, but that is an accusation that is made, and it, again, is a fear-based accusation. Like, in other words, what the, the suggestion basically is, is that uh, you're going to go crazy if you listen to me because I'm crazy. I think it also uh, demonstrates a fair amount of prejudice against people who have been in psychiatric institutions. Yeah. yeah. So what's the problem with being in a psychiatric institution in the sense of, like, I don't see any problem with it. If a person is wanting to deal with their emotions, that's a very positive aspect that they need to follow through. But you get a lot of this stuff now where people say, oh, yeah, you know, we've all got a therapist and all that. There's a lot of derogatory comments even made about that. But the truth is, like you've said, that when, you, when the truth hits your soul and starts changing you, all of a sudden you're a lot wiser now. Does that make sense? In all of your interactions with people, and people who've been studying intellectually for years and years and years and years can't understand how you got this wisdom. Like, how did you get that? And in the end, you got it through your connection with God. 
Uh, that's how you get it, by actually working through the emotional resistances and the emotional blockages and the grief and eventually connecting with God and then these truths resonate with your soul and that's such a powerful process that everyone around you will begin noticing it and as a result of that you'll be surprised where your lives are going to lead as a result of that. Like I've been constantly surprised where my life's led. Um, right the way from the first century experience in terms of just following that, those desires for truth. Yeah, that's a wonderful experience. You're giving me a... <laughs> yes, you are. I was just going to remind you of the time that was on. Yeah, what's the time? It's like 3 o'clock. Oh, 3 o'clock, no worries. Well, what we'll do now is we'll have a break. Um, can we make it a 45 minute break? Um, <laughs> if that's long enough for everyone. And uh, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit more about the projections but also a little bit more about the underlying emotions that we need to work our way through with regard to this situation. Thanks, guys. <laughs>